So welcome to the third video on the series on fluid mechanics. And we're moving on and we finished off with Bernoulli's principle last time. And Bernoulli's principle, just to revision, basically states velocity goes up, the pressure goes down, and it's all nice and dandy. But Bernoulli's principle really deals with ideal fluid. And we know that a fluid's not really ideal, so maybe something else is going on. So we're going to describe what else is going on, what is going on here. And we're going to finish with the, with the hagen poiseuille law. And this really describes the closest thing to what we understand as far as blood flow. So let's get this train going. And just as, just as our vision, again, Bernoulli's principle basically states that an increase in the velocity of fluid is going to be associated with a decrease in pressure. And really, this is just the, the essence of the law. And what we really can expect is, let's just say, I have particles of fluid here. I have particles of fluid all around this tube. And they're all flowing, they're all flowing in that direction. So, so we, we intuitively know that maybe this fluid is flowing that way, this fluid is flowing that way, this particle is flowing that way. And particles that are going to be close to the edge, they're going to be close to the, to the end of the tube, you could say, are going to be actually interacting with this side here. And it's going to slow them down. If you look at this fluid, it's flowing much more freely than this guy here. Maybe there's a guy here that is going to go this way or going to go that way. So really, you can expect fluids that are flowing closer to the center of the tube to, to be less interrupted. And being that they're going to be less interrupted, they're going to flow more freely. And this free flow is going to be a little faster. So if I take a look at this cross section here, this is the center of the tube. And things that are flowing here in the center of the tube are going to be flowing relatively uninterrupted to, uh, to other particles that are flowing close to the ends that are going to be they're going to be bouncing up the ends. So the velocity in the center is going to be higher than the velocity if you, the further you go away. So the further you get away from the center point, the further you get away, the closer you get to the size of the tube, and the more interrupted you're going to be. So the closer I am to the middle, the quicker I'm going to be flowing. So this necessarily means that in the center, due to Bernoulli's principle, I'm going to experience the least pressure. I'm going to experience the least pressure. So hopefully you understood that velocity, let's just say I'm going far away, I'm, I can expect the velocity to go down because I'm interrupting with the size. And being the velocity goes down, my pressure is going to go up. Very good. So now we know that in the center we're going to have the quickest flow and we're going to have the least pressure. Very good. We're making heads now. And what can we expect in, in, in less pressure? Let's just say I'm in a spaceship. This is my spaceship. Some sort of a some sort of weird alien spaceship. And this is this is me inside of it. This is me inside of it, and I'm waving off, and everything's nice and cool. And just like in the movies, let's just say I open a door, someone shoots my spaceship, and suddenly I have a crack here. I know that everything from inside of my spaceship is going to be going out. Everything's going to be going out. Maybe I get sucked out, and I'm floating up in space, and I'm not really happy right now. But what is really going on? You can expect everything that is in higher pressure to go out to the lower pressure environment. So really that also means that particles here, let's just say there's a particle here and there's lower pressure here at this point, it's going to want to get to that lower pressure. So really each of these particles is going to be, is going to be attracted to the center, to the center of the tube. And this necessarily means that in the center of the tube we're going to have more particles. And it just so happens that the closer I get the closer I get to the middle, the velocity is going to be higher, the pressure is going to be lower, and I'm going to have more particles of fluid. And that really is what happens in the blood. You can expect if this is my blood vessel, most of my erythrocytes or most of my red blood cells are going to be, or most of my particles in general, they're going to be kind of huddled in the center, and everything is going to be flowing the fastest in the center. And maybe there are some particles here that are bounced off. And basically, this is what you can expect to see due to these principles. Very good. So we know velocity goes up, pressure goes down, and the velocity is higher when there's no interaction with the size of the tube. And now all the particles are going to be coming into the center because there's lower pressure. So most of our particles are going to be in the middle. Very good. And we're going to move on and discuss what is a real fluid. And, and really, this pertains to somewhat, I uh, touched on it somewhat what is going on here, kind of a little bit. 
but I didn't really call it its name, so let's call it its name. A real fluid is basically a fluid whose particles are interacting with one another. And we know that if, if we have particles here, maybe they're flowing that way, we know that they're going to interact with one another. It's impossible for them not to interact with one another. It's not going to happen. They're obviously going to have some sort of interaction, and this is called viscosity. Viscosity. And viscosity is a liquid's resistance to motion. It's resistance to motion, and let's, let's just, maybe if we were thinking of oil, it has high viscosity, or honey. Honey has high viscosity, definitely higher than water. And water has, water has higher viscosity than air. And if you're saying, oh, air is not a fluid, air is a fluid. Air is a fluid, it's not a liquid, but air and water are both considered fluids. I'm not going to get into the definition of a fluid, but really, air has less viscosity than water. Very good. So let's try and understand the idea of viscosity. And this, this goes towards Newton's laws of motion. And I'm not really going to discuss Newton's laws of motion. And even if you don't know these laws of motion, you're going to be able to understand my example because it's fairly, it's fairly intuitive. Let's just say, and we already mentioned, that cl the closer we are to the center, the quicker the flow is going to be because the less pressure we're going to have in the center. So I can expect particles that are flowing here to, to be flowing faster. And being that we have laminar flow, laminar flow, laminar, I've decided to have laminar flow here. That means there's no great turbulence. That means that my fluid is flowing in layers, layers. Very good. So I have layers of flow, and I know that the layer that is going to be flowing the fastest is going to be this one because it's in the middle. That means that the layer above it is going to be flowing slightly, uh, slightly slower, and maybe this one slightly slower, and this one slower. Whereas when I'm getting to these sides of the tube, I'm going to have a zero velocity of flow right on the side of the tube. Very good. So, so far, so good. And really, this is going back to Newton's first law. If I have relative motion between these two layers, let's just say these layers, this is one layer, I'm going to draw another one in there, let's say pink. This layer is moving relatively faster than this layer. And being that they're moving relatively faster, they're going to have friction. They're going to have friction. And this is the idea of viscosity. Friction between two different layers of flow that are, that are moving relative to one another. And this goes back to Newton's laws of motion. You know what, you don't really need to know this, but this, this goes back to the frame of reference of an object uh, wanting to stay in motion unless interrupted. And this is basically the interruption. And this is why fluids resist to motion, because they are, they are interrupted. There's some sort of interruption to the movement. And this is the idea of real fluids. And essentially, all fluids are real. There isn't an ideal fluid, just like there isn't an ideal gas, and there isn't an ideal anything. So you can expect Bernoulli's law to give us a good idea of what is going on, but it's not the only thing that has taken place. It's not the only law or the only equation. And this brings us to the last player here, the Hagen Poisson law. And this is really what we can expect. First of all, let's read the definition out of Wikipedia. I'm going to mark what's important. In fluid dynamics, the Hagen Poisson equation is a physical law that gives us the pressure drop in a fluid flowing through a long cylindrical pipe. The assumption of the equation are that the flow is laminar, viscous, viscous meaning real, real fluid, real fluid, and incompressible. And the flow is through a constant circular cross section that is substantially longer than its diameter. What really, what this is really, what this means is that the tube would look something like this and not something like this. And by this, I mean that it's going to be considerably longer than it is wide. So it's not going to be, not going to be such a cylinder. This is not really, this is kind of a, a weirdly shaped hose. It's going to be more like this. Very good. So first of all, you see this big thing, and you're kind of wondering, what's going on? What is this whole thing? So let me make it a little bit simpler for you, a little bit simpler. And even if you don't interpret this whole equation, you don't understand it right away, not a big deal. This is the change in pressure, change in pressure. This is the radius. Pi is just something tasty. This is the volumetric flow rate, or in our lecture slides, it's V of I, volumetric, volumetric. 
flow rate. L is the length of the pipe, length. And mu here is the dynamic viscosity. So being that I like to dis instill intuition, I'm not going to really talk about the whole physical mathematical idea of this equation. All I'm really going to do is ask you to look at this. Let's take a look. Let's consider the radius. When the radius goes up, what is going to happen to the pressure? Well, just by looking at this equation, radius would go up, the pressure would go down. And this is basically basically what the hagen poiseuille law gives us. It gives us the pressure drop, the pressure drop relative to the uh, to the radius. So that really means that really means that if I have some sort of blood vessel here, this is my blood vessel, and it slowly fans out and fans out. Maybe this is my aorta, and it fans out to really smaller, smaller, smaller blood vessels. Basically, the cross section increases. We already discussed this. The cross section increases, so the radius increases. The radius is going up. And in any of these places where the radius is going up, we're going to have a pressure drop. And this is really to the fourth power. This is r to the fourth. This is to the fourth power. So you can say that the radius is going to have an immense, an immense effect, an immense effect on the pressure drop, on the pressure drop. So this is really the take-home message from the hagen poiseuille law. And this is for laminar, laminar fluid of real fluids. And this means that when the radius would go up, I'm going to experience a pressure drop. And this is really what is happening in day-to-day -day lives with, with the flow of blood in our body. Hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. And I was trying to keep to the very essentials to make sure you understand rather than remember the equation. I don't think you really need to. Just you need to understand how the pressure relates to the radius. Very good. Hopefully you found this helpful. See you in the next video.